Welcome to reInvent 2023. So glad you decided to make this the first stop on your reInvent journey. Uh, this is running OpenShift on AWS with the Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS, or ROSA. My name is Eric Chapman. I'm a senior product manager at AWS. I've been working closely with our friends at Red Hat for two plus years now, uh, delivering the ROSA service. And I'm here today presenting with Trey. Trey, introduce yourself and take us away. Hey, everybody. My name is Trey Haney, and I'm a container specialist here at AWS. Um, that just means I get to talk to customers about containers all day, every day. So all of our container portfolio at AWS, but specifically talk a lot about Rosa, or Red Hat OpenShift on AWS. So before we get kicked off, this is you know early morning session, uh, you know, do a little interactive audience participation. Just kind of curious, is anyone here using OpenShift today? Show of hands. Got some hands, cool, quite a few. How about Rosa? All right, good, good. Uh, what about just Kubernetes? How many have like started Kubernetes and like, you know, just, just gave up on Kubernetes because it was hard? Anyone? No hands? I also can't see because of the lights. It's <laughs> like one hand out there. All right, well, cool, good. Um, you know, we get people from like a platform team, central IT. Yes, what about different like business, like developer teams? No. All right, so kind of a, a mix audience-wise, people who've used OpenShift, some people using Rosa, some people using Kubernetes. That's well, good, It's good. So just really quick, I uh, wanted to go over the agenda really quickly. Um, we're gonna start by touching on some of the common requirements that customers regularly communicate to us. Uh, we'll then discuss how running apps in containers can help accelerate uh, your innovation of your app teams, um, as well as some of the challenges that they introduce as well. Then we're gonna dive into Rosa um, and help how Rosa can help resolve many of those challenges introduced by the container paradigm. And then of course you have a couple options for how you deploy Rosa clusters on AWS and we'll highlight the different approaches there. Uh, then we'll just go into discussing recent launches, uh, upcoming features on the roadmap, and then of course we'll end with Q&A. But first let's kinda describe a, a little bit of a scenario. Some of this you've probably lived yourselves, right? Your company wants to migrate to the cloud uh, and you've been tasked with developing the shared services platform over the environment that your company will land all of your applications on. Now, today, most of your company's apps run on-prem. You've got monoliths running in VMs. You might have some applications running to like directly on metal. Maybe there's a few pockets of customers playing around with containers. Uh, or maybe you even have like some commercial off-the-shelf software, some COTS applications as well. And of course, your goal is to migrate as fast as possible to the cloud. Now, you know that you know, there's a wide variety of skill differences uh, across your company. Some of these applications are ready for migration, some are not. But again, your goal is to migrate quickly. Now, with these hundreds of apps, it's a lot to manage. And you want a solution that takes on the management overhead so your teams can focus on delivering business value, not on managing operational, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Now, as you evaluate options, there's a lot to consider. And today we'll talk through some of those options and discuss how Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS can help you. So let's go a little bit more into the requirements that you may have. As you evaluate your path to cloud migration, there are a lot of things to consider. So we're gonna to touch base on some of the common requirements that customers operating in the cloud have today. So again, as a senior container specialist, I talk to a lot of customers and they communicate, you know, pretty much these, these common questions or these themes to us almost daily. Uh, customers say they need to innovate quickly to deliver value to their customers. Uh, they want their development teams to focus on delivering applications as quickly as possible and not have to worry about operational tasks like configuring infrastructure or, or managing consistency between different environments. They want their infrastructure to be reliable, highly available, but they also want something that's secure and cost efficient and some level of customization to their needs. They want something or a platform or a vendor with a proven track record of scaling to whatever size they need but also the ability to scale up and scale down rapidly. They want security and isolation and then control over access and permissions. And of course, they want some way to use automation to reduce human error. Now, AWS has 250 plus services. It gives you many options for meeting those needs. But let's double click on some of these questions or requirements a little more. As a customer, of course, you, know, you need to be able to configure and customize your environment to meet your needs. But do you really want to manage the infrastructure underlying your platform? For most companies, managing cloud infrastructure is undifferentiated heavy lifting, and choosing a managed service will meet your requirements at a much lower operational cost. With managed services, AWS, and in this case, Red Hat, <clears throat> take on the operational effort of managing AWS infrastructure on your behalf, so you can focus on developing applications and delivering value. 
Remember, our goal is to establish an environment for cloud migration. Our goal isn't to hire or expand a large team or develop the expertise to build and manage cloud infrastructure. So by leveraging a managed service, we can outsource this lifting on differentiated management layer to somebody else. Now, from your perspective, kind of on this you know, platform team developing a strategy for how you migrate things to the cloud, uh, you want a consistent operational experience wherever you run. And as you kick off your migration journey, uh, you'll have workloads, workflows, and of course, applications spanning AWS and on-prem environments. As your number of apps increases and environments expands, it's gonna create the need for operational consistency, things like access control across workloads, business unit, and infrastructure. You don't wanna to have to worry about developing bespoke processes for each and every one of these environments. Now, consistency in managing, provisioning, and operating across multiple environments is paramount when considering how to meet your migration and operational goals. So at this point, you know, we're talking about the migration, you might be thinking a couple of questions to yourself in addition to the requirements. You know, how can I actually move these workloads into the cloud? Uh, how can I actually modernize my apps? How do I give my developers a self-service platform? I don't want to have to give them uh, the environment or have to have them submit a ticket and then create the environment for them every time they ask. How do I get consistent tooling and governments across all of these things? Again, I don't want to build those bespoke processes for each and every environment. And then, of course, how do I scale up and down quickly to react to a rapidly changing world? And so for a lot of customers, uh, containerizing application is one path that they've taken to answering these questions and the requirements on the previous slides. Now, we all know the containers resolve a lot of these challenges, but they also introduce quite a few new ones. So backing up a little bit more into you know, why do customers adopt containers? Uh, over the last decade plus, customers have chosen to modernize their applications by running them in containers. Just like a standardized shipping container size uh, has provided a standardized way to move freight around the world and revolutionize the shipping industry, containers do the same thing for your applications. Now, containers enable you to package software into standardized units for deployment, shipping, <coughs> and deployment. With these standardized units of code, you can be confident your applications will run consistently across different environments, everything from your local desktop to the cloud. Now, containers are, most, are also uh, operationally efficient to virtual machines. So this allows us to increase our workload density uh, across our infrastructure and reduce costs. All the ability to right-size our environment to our usage. You can rapidly spin up instances of a containerized application, which gives us to facilitate rapid testing and agile iteration of those applications. Now, by moving to a more controlled and repeatable environment uh, and embracing this automation, we see things like product delivery and velocity dramatically increase, while also improving our quality, stability, and security. All sounds fantastic. Containers are the, are the way to go. But, you know, again, there are some things to consider. Uh, when containers adopt, customers adopt containers, there is definitely a learning curve. It's not all simple. Uh, building out the shared services platform based on containers uh, requires you stitching together tooling that you may not be familiar with or your teams may not be familiar with. Uh, automating things with infrastructure as code are also best practices, but where do you start? And also, what does this mean for things like observability or security when we're talking about containers? Not to mention, um, how do we look at all this from a cost standpoint if we're, if we're concerned about FinOps? Now, a container orchestration platform can answer a lot of these questions for us. And so one of the many orchestration platforms that customers standardize on is Kubernetes. If you're not familiar, Kubernetes or Kates is an open source system for automating, deploying, and scaling containerized applications. Now, even with the container management layer that Kubernetes provides us, uh, you still need to choose the components to integrate them into your platform to give you a holistic environment. Now, this is a picture of all the services in the CNCF. If you're not familiar, uh, the CNCF is a cloud native computing foundation. This is the governing body uh, that owns Kubernetes and kind of sets the direction for it. Now, if your team is starting from scratch with containers or Kubernetes, this is a little bit of a daunting task, this view here. You know, there is no shortage of amazing tools in the Kate's ecosystem, but there's also no guide for you how to put it all together. You want the operational benefits of containers, but your task is to drive a rapid migration. Your team doesn't have the time or necessarily the expertise to build out the application platform yourself. So we've come to the conclusion that containers are gonna meet our needs, right? It's gonna give us the ability to migrate quickly to the cloud, and Kubernetes is gonna be our orchestration layer for the container, for the containers to run on top of. 
So let's talk about some of the options for how you can actually run Kubernetes on AWS and how Rosa fits into this. So again, quite a few options, different ways to build containers on Kubernetes. First off, we can do DIY it, right? We can do this ourselves. We can deploy this directly on EC2 infrastructure. We can go off and get ourselves a Kubernetes distro, and we can get ourselves some sort of tooling to deploy Kubernetes directly to the environment. Now, this option gives us pretty much complete and ultimate control, right? We can configure everything uh, this way on top of AWS, but it's gonna come at a much higher operational cost. You know, at the end of the day, we're looking to reduce our operational complexity and rapidly migrate, not add complexity to our environments. So in our situation, kind of walking through these requirements, uh, a DIY Kubernetes may not be the right choice. Now, another option that moves us more into the managed service territory is EKS, or Elastic Kubernetes Service. Now, Amazon EKS helps by managing the control plane on your behalf, moving the Kubernetes API and etcd into an AWS management VPC. Now, EKS simplifies a lot of things for us. We can leverage AWS native services, uh, like CloudWatch for observability. We can use ECR for container registry, not to mention AWS optimized machine images for the different worker nodes. But there's still operational work required of us. How do we manage lifecycle updates? How do we upgrade the data plane? The control plane is managed for us by AWS, but the data plane is still our responsibility. So when it comes time to upgrade, it's on us to make sure that we're upgrading the services and the worker nodes that make up our data plane for EKS. And again, it's on us to install and manage any of the cluster services uh, that provide things like networking or ingress. But what if we want something to go out of the box? This is where Rosa comes in, or Red Hat OpenShift on AWS. If you're not familiar, OpenShift is a containerized application platform developed and supported by Red Hat. It's built on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Kubernetes. And the big thing is it's turnkey. Rosa has everything you need to run a containerized application out of the box. This includes built-in services like observability, allowing you to monitor everything from your application to your infrastructure, and many other services available as operators to the operator hub. Not to mention uh, features that make this experience easier for developers. This is a big thing. How do I get my developers using containers, developing applications in containers? And how do I get them to go from their application developed in a container to running inside of Kubernetes? Uh, there's a console that simplifies many of the operational aspects of running Kubernetes, along with a CLI and tools for code editors, IDE, and more. Now, if you notice on this graphic, one other thing here is that you have support spanning the entire stack. Now, these default integrations are all available with enterprise-grade technical support provided by Red Hat SREs. This is a huge benefit to customers running <coughs> Rosa in AWS, getting support on the entire stack. So, I'd like to say that Rosa is uh, batteries included, but swappable. So what if we have some sort of preferred tooling? Maybe we've got a third-party observability platform that you know, we've been mandated to use. Well, with the OpenShift platform, you can swap out the default tool chain to better meet your organization's operational requirements. So OpenShift already has default platform integrations, and they're all built on popular open source projects uh, like Istio for Service Mesh, uh, Tekton for CICD, and Argo CD for GitOps. And of course, as you gain more experience working with the platform uh, and get more familiar uh, with the Kubernetes ecosystem, you might decide that different components better meet your needs. So you can always swap those in uh, leveraging Kubernetes modularity as well. So we've talked about the features of the service that are built into Rosa that make your life easier, but what about the support? Who's responsible for what? Now again, we saw on the previous slide the support uh, bar spanned the entire stack in Rosa. And as you can see here from this thing, uh, this graphic, uh, as we move further towards the right on Rosa, Red Hat and AWS are managing the complete stack for you. Now, we can run, of course, OpenShift on-prem. We can run OpenShift in a self-managed fashion uh, on top of EC2 nodes or cloud infrastructure. But again, we're gonna be responsible for more of the components, more of the pieces from a support aspect, particularly the control plane and the worker nodes. With Rosa, we can shift that responsibility to AWS and Red Hat, where we can leverage Red Hat SREs or site reliability engineers to help us manage the OpenShift platform and the underlying AWS infrastructure on our behalf. 
So let's recap quickly some of the, the benefits of Rosa. It aligns to a cloud-first strategy by making Kate easier, right? Uh, it simplifies the operation, the management of Kubernetes uh, by giving you an application platform built on top of it with plenty of developer experiences. And that includes things like uh, day two operations built in. It's turnkey. Again, when you spin up a Rosa cluster, we can immediately begin hosting our containerized applications on it. With Rosa, we're getting not just <clears throat> a managed cluster, well, sorry, rather, we are getting a managed cluster and not just a managed control plane. We're getting support on everything from the control plane to the worker nodes. Again, this is reducing our operational burden of how we manage Kubernetes. We're getting proactive versus reactive support. That's 24-7, follow the sun by Red Hat SREs. All these things help us focus on driving business value and not on operations. So we've determined that Rosa meets our needs uh, in terms of providing comprehensive application platform uh, that you don't have to manage in the cloud yourself. But you're probably curious about the architectural and what this kind of looks like deployed on AWS infrastructure. So Eric, can you walk us through some of that? Yeah, thanks, Trey. So coming back to the scenario that Trey introduced at the beginning, you're an operator. You're interested in learning more about the nuts and bolts of how Rosa runs in your account. At this point, you're asking questions like, how does Rosa run in my environment? What AWS resources does it provision? Um, how does Rosa integrate and how do the workloads running on Rosa integrate with other AWS services? How can I automate consistent patterns for creating Rosa clusters? And how does Rosa help me migrate my on-prem workloads up to the cloud and run across cloud and on-prem environments? In the next few slides, we'll dive into the nitty gritty on how Rosa runs into your environment before I discuss some of the features that we've brought to, uh, that we've brought to you in 2023 and what we have planned through the end of 23 and going into 2024. So we give you many architectural choices when uh, determining how you create your Rosa cluster so that you can create clusters that are aligned with your use cases. I'm now going to discuss the three primary architectural decisions that you'll make when creating a Rosa cluster. First, you'll decide whether you want your cluster exposed to the public internet. The wide majority of our customers, especially those running in production today, choose to run Rosa in a private VPC without any public, without any public subnets or, uh, or internet gateways. Second, you'll choose rather to run Rosa in a single availability zone or, across, or spread across multiple availability zones. This decision comes down to your workload's need for availability. A single availability zone architecture may be appropriate for dev and test workloads where infrastructure efficiency takes precedent over availability. But for customers running in production, the vast majority of them choose to run across uh, multiple availability zones. Finally, you'll choose whether to run the Rosa Classic, the classic Rosa deployment model, or the new Rosa with hosted control planes, or HCP deployment model. With Rosa Classic, the EC2 instances and, the AWS re and all the AWS resources running the Rosa control plane, infrastructure services, and worker, worker nodes all live within your AWS environment. Rosa with HCP, on the other hand, is a, is a new deployment model that's been in public tech preview for the past several months and is planned to go GA in December. Our customers are really excited about Rosa with HCP, and so are we. I'll dive into the details on the Rosa with HCP architecture later on in the deck, but at a high level, Rosa with HCP moves the control plane components and some of the other infrastructure components out of your AWS environment and into a centralized Rosa service account, saving you on AWS infrastructure costs. So what AWS resources make up a Rosa cluster? Let's consider your use cases and diagram out an architecture that would meet your needs. So coming back to our scenario, let's say that the first application that you're planning on migrating up to the cloud using Rosa is a banking platform. You have application components for transaction processing, data management, and customer service, to name a few. Your platform requires high availability, and you only want to expose front-end components to the public internet, say, a web console, a mobile application, a customer service chatbot. Customers with requirements like yours running on Rosa in production today, most often choose the Rosa Classic multi-AZ private link architecture seen on this slide. But we expect more and more customers will opt for the Rosa with hosted control plane option once that deployment model is GA. So let's review the AWS services that underlie a Rosa cluster hosting your application. 
We'll start by building up to the Rosa Classic multi-AZ private link architecture seen on this slide. Before I dive into the details on what, what differentiates Rosa with hosted control planes from Rosa Classic. So you start by creating an Amazon VPC. And as this is a private link cluster, you create a VPC with three private subnets, no public subnets, or internet gateways. We recommend creating a single VPC for every Rosa cluster that you run to help stay within AWS service quota constraints and limit blast radius. With Rosa Classic, the EC2 instances hosting your worker nodes, control plane, and infrastructure services all sit within your AWS environment, starting with the worker nodes. The worker nodes host your workloads. These are primarily containerized applications, as, as Trey discussed, and OpenShift operators. But with the introduction of OpenShift virtualization, you can also run virtual machines alongside containers within a single Rosa cluster. I'll dive into the details a little bit more um, on that in a, in a future slide. Rosa charges on-demand service fees per worker node vCPU hour. So the components of your banking platform, the, the transaction processing application, data management application, and customer service application, have different requirements for compute and memory optimization and different scaling behavior. Customer traffic, is largely un, customer traffic going into your customer service application is largely uncorrelated with your data management compute needs. With Rosa and with OpenShift in general, you create what are called um, OpenShift machine pools which enable you to create right-sized compute environments for each application component and set scaling behavior on individual machine, uh, machine pools to meet your needs. With Rosa Classic, in addition to the worker nodes, you'll be running a minimum of three Rosa infrastructure nodes and three Rosa control plane nodes in your account. The infrastructure nodes host the OpenShift routing layer, the, the built-in container registry, and the Prometheus monitoring stack. As of OpenShift version 4.14, uh, customer requests ingress to your cluster through a, a ne an Amazon network load balancer. This provides for greater scalability, lower latency, and greater overall performance than the classic load balancer implementation you would find on earlier versions of OpenShift. Now moving on to the control plane. The control plane hosts the Kubernetes API server, Kubernetes controllers, as well as the etcd key value store, which monitors, uh, which keeps track of cluster state. Your cluster administrators can take action against the OpenShift, uh, against the OpenShift API running on the control plane to do things like creating new machine pools, creating OpenShift projects. As OpenShift provides services on top of the Kubernetes layer, your administrators can also take action directly against the Kubernetes API or use command line tools like the kubectl CLI. Now, as this is a multi-AZ architecture, your EC2 instances running the control plane infrastructure nodes and worker nodes run across three AWS availability zones. This provides for fault tolerance. In a case where an AZ goes down or there's an outage, your application will continue to run, your cluster will remain available. And to deliver a fully managed OpenShift experience, Rosa SREs continuously monitor your cluster health and take proactive remediating action, like life cycling a worker node or scaling out the control plane where needed. To perform these tasks, Rosa SRE obtains short-lived credentials from the AWS Security Token Service that allow them to take limited actions against your AWS account over an AWS private link connection. Now, Let's say the transaction processing application that's part of this banking platform that you're migrating needs to ingest data from your corporate data center, run some processing on that data, and serve the results over the public internet. How do you do that? So you start by creating an AWS Direct Connect connection on your corporate data center, which enables secure data egress over an AWS Transit Gateway into your VPC. Once the data is, has, uh, has entered your VPC, is running on your worker nodes, you can, your transaction processing application does some transaction processing, and you want to serve the results back out over the public web. As this is a private link cluster, you don't have an internet gateway running in your VPC. So the common approach our customers take is they'll set up a second Amazon VPC specifically to handle uh, traffic egress, serving data over the public internet. And you would connect this egress VPC um, using another AWS Transit gateway to your Rosa VPC. 
So we've talked about some of the AWS resources that underlie a ROSA cluster, uh, but your transaction processing app needs to integrate with other AWS services like databases and message queues. How do you integrate applications running on ROSA with other AWS services? First, you can use the VPC gateway endpoint to take transactions against Amazon S3 and Amazon DynamoDB specifically without requiring an internet gateway or NAT device. Second, you can connect your, the applications running within a ROSA cluster to other AWS managed services like uh, Amazon SageMaker using an AWS private link connection. If you take this approach, we recommend creating a second private link connection on your ROSA VPC rather than reusing or repurposing the private link connection used by ROSA SRE. Next, you can use AWS Transit Gateway to connect your ROSA VPC to a shared services VPC. The shared services VPC could also be private and it could be running uh, Amazon services like Amazon RDS. If both your shared services VPC and ROSA VPC are private, you can, um, you can connect both of these VPCs up to an egress VPC um, that has internet gateways and public subnets if you want to serve data over the public internet as needed. So the ROSA Classic Multi-AZ private link architecture meets your operational needs, meets the needs of your team. But infrastructure costs add up, and you'd rather not run managed uh, control plane components or infrastructure services within your AWS environment. Customers have regularly asked us for a more infrastructure, a more infrastructure efficient way to run ROSA, and that's one of the primary benefits of ROSA with hosted control planes. For ROSA with HCP, the control plane nodes and most of the services provided by the infrastructure nodes move out of your AWS account and into a centrally managed ROSA service account, significantly bringing down the infrastructure cost of running a ROSA cluster. The, ROSA, the centrally managed ROSA VPC connects to the VPC running in your AWS account over a private link endpoint. ROSA with HCP clusters will incur a per, a per cluster hour fee in addition to the worker node per vCPU hour feed fee described earlier, but we still expect a significant reduction in the total cost of ownership of running ROSA based on um, the reduced infrastructure spend. So ROSA with HCP is the most significant update to the ROSA service since our la launch in March of 2021. In December, we plan to roll ROSA with HCP out GA in six regions, Virginia, Ohio, Oregon, Dublin, Frankfurt, and Jakarta. We'll be running out, rolling out to more and more commercial AWS regions uh, throughout the first half of 2024, starting in January. Now, in addition to the infrastructure ef efficiency gains that you get with ROSA with HCP, ROSA with HCP clusters also spin up in about a quarter of the time it takes for a ROSA Classic cluster to spin up today, getting you into production faster. We've also introduced a series of AWS managed policies for ROSA with HCP. This streamlines the cluster upgrade process as AWS takes on the responsibility for updating the AWS policies, the IAM policies used by ROSA roles. And in the first half of 2024, we'll be introducing the ability to spin ROSA machine pools, ROSA with HCP machine pools, including the default machine pool, down to zero nodes, facilitating additional cost savings when you spin down workloads when they're not in use, say, workloads running on a test cluster over, a week, over the weekend. Now, moving away from your baking application, moving away from ROSA with hosted control plane, you know that you have a number of applications running on OpenShift or running in containers on-prem um, or elsewhere in your environments. Some of these applications will be migrating up to the cloud, while others will remain on-prem. With the Red Hat Hybrid Cloud Console, you can observe and interact with your OpenShift clusters wherever they run. ROSA clusters created on AWS automatically in integrate with the Red Hat Hybrid Cloud Console to give you a holistic overview of who's running OpenShift where. So you have a number of applications that are containerized and ready to migrate up to the cloud, ready to migrate onto ROSA. Well, Red Hat has, in, uh, has introduced the Migration Toolkit for Containers, or MTC Operator, which you deploy onto your ROSA cluster and onto the target cluster from the, uh, from the OpenShift Operator Hub. The operator implements a console interface for planning and executing your migration. Now say some, of your app, some, some other applications that you want to migrate up aren't yet containerized, but you want to migrate quickly. ROSA provides tools like source to image, which enables you to inject your source code into ready-to-run container images so that you can get to the cloud quickly. 
However, some of your applications are running in VMs and uh, are, are really not yet ready for containerization. To provide a consistent management experience across containerized and virtualized workloads, we recently introduced support for OpenShift virtualization. Based on the KubeVirt project, OpenShift virtualization enables you to run Linux and Windows VMs alongside containers on a single OpenShift Rosa platform, simplifying management and shortening your time to migration. OpenShift virtualization allows you to move to the cloud faster by rehosting before you containerize your applications while taking advantage of OpenShift constructs for pipelines, GitOps, and service, for service mesh, to name a few, for those virtualized workloads. Okay, so you've developed a migration strategy that allows for speed to the cloud while, uh, while facilitating on-prem and, while facilitating across on-prem and cloud environments and catering to both containerized applications and those that are still running in VMs. How are you actually gonna go about consistently creating uh, ROSA clusters? So creating cloud infrastructure in a consistent, repeatable way can be challenging. Handling updates to uh, mission critical infrastructure in a manual way introduces risk, and managing uh, custom built scripts adds operational burden. Previously, you could only use the ROSA CLI tool, maybe you can wrap some automation around it, or the Red Hat Hybrid Cloud Console to provision ROSA clusters. We recently introduced ROSA Classic support for Terraform. HashiCorp Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool that enables you to write human-readable configuration files for cloud resource provisioning that you can version, reuse, and share. Um, the ROSA Classic support for Terraform is facilitated by a Red Hat Cloud Services Terraform provider and ROSA cluster modules. The ROSA modules enable you to uh, define ROSA clusters, machine pools, and identity providers on AWS, along with the other AWS services that the, the applications running on your ROSA cluster will use. Support for ROSA with hosted control planes for Terraform is planned for the first half of 2024. And with Terraform, customers now can provision those ROSA clusters along with the other AWS services that they plan uh, for those applications to run, all within a unified sort of system here. All right, so you're confident that ROSA best aligns with your goals and your requirements. You'll utilize private, multi-AZ ROSA with hosted control plane clusters to host your apps in a way that's secure, efficient, and highly available. You'll leverage migration tooling provided by ROSA to move to the cloud quickly, and you'll use Terraform to automate deployments of ROSA clusters. Now, you're interested in kicking off a POC, a proof of concept, but before you do so, you want to learn more about recent enhancements to the service and what we have planned through the rest of the year and into 2024. I'll now briefly touch on some of the service enhancements not discussed on previous slides, along with other upcoming ROSA enhancements. Plans do tend to change, so please, uh, please take any of the timeframes that I mentioned here as plans but not commitments. So how have we updated ROSA in 2023? So with the industry-wide shift to focus on AI, there's more and more of a need for accelerated compute. In 2023, we introduced ROSA support for NVIDIA-based GPU instances in the P3, P4, G4, and G5 instance families, along with the DL1 instance types from Habana Labs. We plan to introduce support for the NVIDIA P5-based instances um, before the end of the year here. Customers can build their own AI ops toolchain on top of ROSA, or they can leverage Red Hat OpenShift AI, which augments ROSA with AI ML frameworks and notebooks and other tooling to take, to take models from training up through fine tuning and serving and monitoring um, all out of the box. Moving on to deployment options, AWS regions cover large geographic areas. But some use cases, say online gaming and financial services, require single-digit millisecond latency or local data processing to meet data residency requirements. AWS Local Zones caters to these needs, and in 2023, we brought ROSA deployments to AWS Local Zones. We also gave customers the ability to implement custom AWS resource tags at cluster provisioning time. 
Customers use resource tags to track their spend across clusters and across business units. And with the launch of this feature, customers can now include um, AWS resource tagging as part of their automated cluster provisioning workflows so they can effectively track costs as soon as those resources are created by Rosa. From a networking perspective, some of our customers choose to centralize the management of their networking components like VPCs or Route 53 hosted zones. Um, to enable this pattern, we introduce shared VPC support, which gives customers the ability to create uh, networking components in one account and share access to specific subnets from the VPC to other AWS accounts responsible for managing resources like Rosa clusters within those accounts. We also introduce support for the AWS load balancer controller. This allows you to create network load balancers and application load balancers as Rosa ingress controllers. Finally, we expanded the availability of Rosa into, uh, into more AWS regions, specifically in the UAE, Spain, Melbourne, Hyderabad, and Zurich. So what do we have coming up over 2024? So as I mentioned earlier, Rosa with Hosted Control Planes is due to roll out GA in six regions in December. Throughout the first half of 2024, we'll be rolling Rosa with HCP out GA um, in all of the regions that Rosa, that Rosa Classic operates in today. We'll also be expanding Rosa into the Tel Aviv region and other regions that go GA over the course of 2024. This brings us to discussion of compliance certifications. Many US public sector customers are required to run in the AWS GovCloud regions at FedRAMP High. Now, Rosa Classic has achieved an agency authority to operate at FedRAMP High and has been prioritized for JAB review for early 2024. You can access Rosa Classic at FedRAMP High and GovCloud by working directly with your Red Hat representative, but by the end of the year, we plan to introduce a self-service uh, self process for kicking off GovCloud onboarding for Rosa. Rosa with HCP implementation at FedRAMP High and in GovCloud is currently in the planning phase, and we expect the Rosa GovCloud deployments will be a, a, a continuing use case for Rosa Classic over the coming quarters. Now, in addition to those customers that need to run um, at FedRAMP High in the GovCloud regions, there's another set of customers that need to run in the non-GovCloud AWS commercial regions at FedRAMP Medium. In the second half of 2024, we'll be pursuing FedRAMP Medium certification, specifically for the Rosa with HCP deployment model. And as the Rosa with HCP deployment model is new, it doesn't yet have many of the certifications that Rosa Classic has, including SOC 2, SOC 3, ISO, PCI DSS, and some regional certifications like IRAP. Throughout the first half of 2024, we'll be working to achieve certification parity between Rosa Classic and Rosa with HCP outside of FedRAMP High, which will come later for Rosa with HCP. Coming back to your deployment options, some AWS customers, specifically those operating in the telco space, are required to integrate their Rosa compute and uh, storage within their 5G networks. AWS Wavelength caters to this need, and in 2024, we'll be rate bringing Rosa support to AWS Wavelength. Lastly, we'll be introducing new, new instance families uh, to be supported by Rosa. In addition to the NVIDIA-based P5 instances I mentioned earlier, we'll be introducing ARM-based Graviton support for Rosa with HCP machine pools, planned for the first half of the year. Customers love the Graviton instances based on their uh, enhanced uh, cost performance profile, and we're really excited to bring them to you with Rosa. We'll also be adding support for new uh, next-generation instance families and new instance types as they go GA. Before we close, I want to highlight one use case that we're particularly excited about, and that's running IBM business software on Rosa. So IBM has re-architected and architected the next generation of their business software products like the Maximo application suite to run on Rosa. You can procure these products through the AWS marketplace as managed SaaS, um, in which case the Rosa clusters, the OpenShift clusters hosting those, that software won't run in your AWS environment. But the managed SaaS option will not work for some customers with advanced security, configuration, integration needs. And if that's you, you can instead run your IBM software on Rosa clusters, on OpenShift clusters, hosted in your AWS account. And Rosa gives you the ability to do this without, manage it, without worrying about managing the underlying platform. So when you're considering where to run your IBM software, we want Rosa to be top of mind. So, if you're interested in getting started with Rosa, learning a bit more, you've got a few options. 
First, there's the, Rosa, the new Rosa hands-on experience, which you access from the Red Hat Rosa product page linked from this QR code here. This new hands-on experience gives you a fully-fledged Rosa with HCP cluster at no cost for up to eight hours. Use this cluster to practice building, deploying, and scaling an application using Rosa. Second, you can attend a Rosa workshop. We deliver these as large virtual events, but we can also work with you and your team to structure a bespoke workshop that aligns with your use cases and scenarios. Lastly, if you're ready, you can, uh, you can, you can enter into a Rosa proof of concept at no cost, where AWS and Red Hat experts will help you migrate one of your applications onto a Rosa cluster running into your environment. Please reach out to Trey and I, talk to us after this talk, or I'll be putting our email addresses up at the end here. If you're interested in a bespoke Rosa workshop, or if you're interested in a proof of concept. Lastly, you have many more options for learning more about Rosa at reInvent. You can stop by the Red Hat booth, that's booth 364. You could talk to us over at the Kubernetes stand in the AWS Village, or you can attend one of the other Open, or one of the other reInvent sessions featuring Rosa. Tomorrow, Red Hat and Air Canada will be delivering a session on Air Canada's journey with Rosa. On Wednesday, Red Hat and AWS will have a session over at the Red Hat booth, a modernizing application workloads using Rosa focused on IBM, SAS, MuleSoft, and other, other COTS applications, migrating those up to the cloud with Rosa. And lastly, my Red Hat PM colleague, Aaron, who's floating around here somewhere, will be delivering a couple Rosa with HCP uh, deep dive sessions over at the Red Hat booth. So thank you very much. Thank you for stopping by here as the, uh, the first stop on your reInvent journey. Thanks, Thank you.